And now I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, who's speaking on Montana and the Cold War. John Axline is a graduate of Montana State University and has worked at the Montana Department of Transportation since 1990. He's the author of a number of books and articles, including Conveniences Sorely Needed, Montana's Historic Highway Bridges, Taming Big Sky Country, The History of Montana Transportation from Trails to Interstate, and the article Operation Skywatch, the Montana Ground Observation Corps, 1952 to 1959, which appeared in the summer 2017 issue of Montana, the magazine of Western history and is particularly relevant for his talk today. So with no further ado, please help me welcome John Axline. Well, good afternoon. So I'm looking at the crowd here and think I may be preaching to the choir for a lot of this. Um, I usually teach, a, a, I'm an adjunct instructor at Helena College and I have post-World War II American history there and most of my students were born after the Cold War ended. So to talk about that, it's all kind of like they can't believe that the United States was actually like that at one time. So um, I bet all of you have your own Cold War stories and, and remember it all very well. And maybe some of you even participated in the dreaded duck and cover drills, <laughs> which, uh, which, I, which I did as well, except they called them earthquake drills by that time. But it was all all the same thing. So today I'm going to talk about a, a subject that's really kind of near and dear, or has become near and dear to my heart. And I think a lot of the reason is um, I just turned 60 here last month and, and I'm beginning to realize that a lot of the history that I've lived so far during my own life has uh, evolved around subjects that really haven't been tackled very much yet in Montana history. And, and this is one of them. I mean, we all know about it. We've all driven by the missile silos. Uh, we all know about uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base and, and all that, but it's really something we don't really know about. And so I'm hoping over time to change that and it'll give me a good um, project to work on when I finally get to retire and not have to write articles about roads anymore. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I will get, dig right into it. Um, you know, Montana was definitely on the front line of the Cold War. I think we all have the tendency to believe here in remote, isolated Montana that um, we were kind of a long ways away from many of the international politics that really characterized that period in, in American history. But in actuality, we were right there all along. We were a part of it and not so much um, removed from it that, uh, of course, we know about the missiles being based here and about the importance of Malmstrom, but uh, what would make Montana, do you think, kind of important anyway to the Cold War? And something that we all know and love here and we kind of have grown accustomed to and right, try very hard to protect. So what do you think it is that maybe was a part of the Cold War that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily think of? No people, wide open spaces and no people. So, and we were right on the path. Location, location. Yeah, location, location, <laughs> location. Exactly. Uh, the reason being is that the military planners, at least during the first decade or so of the, of the Cold War, believed that if the Russians were going to attack the United States, they were going to come over the North Pole, that that was the most direct route over sparsely settled Montana and the Dakotas right into the American heartland. So right from the very beginning, we were on the front lines of the Cold War. And as we all know, the war had a pretty profound impact on all of us, the same way that the World War II had on our parents and World War I on our, on our grandparents. As I remember the duck and cover drills, I'm sure that most of you do, um, I remembered having to go sit through a health class when I was in eighth grade on how to survive a nuclear war. And I mean, that's pretty heady stuff to, to give to a 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid, you know, is how are you going to survive a war that has the potential to wipe out all life on Earth? And uh, 
But we learned that when the uh, missiles fell there around Malmstrom, we had about 90 seconds to get to the bomb shelter, which was coincidentally in one of the rooms I was taking the health class in, so at the Helena Junior High. So, but again, um, we all knew this time, this is different from our, our parents and grandparents as well, that the next war could very possibly kill everybody and leave the planet dead. And uh, that was really a new concept that we all had to, uh, to deal with, even here in lonely Montana. And it could be fairly frightening as long as you didn't think about it too much. But here's an example of the kind of things that you would see quite a bit. Uh, one of my favorite things is old 1950s science fiction movies. And part of that always meant that, you know, the alien was a, was a metaphor for a communist. And that there was also quite a bit of stuff about the results of, of a nuclear war, usually involving some kind of a mutation or whatever. But, uh, but it's just this kind of stuff that really made the Cold War pervasive and maybe more of a subtle way than just overtly um, looking at the military aspects of it. All right. But again, this is what we all had to look forward to if things got out of hand, and who knows, that could very well happen still if we're not careful. But uh, again, the, the duck and cover drills that uh, your, the Bert the turtle and the whole works that um, actuality, this wouldn't have probably saved anybody. But it was supposed to, I think, make people feel a little bit safer in the new political and, and military environment. But again, here's the route that they probably would have taken to get to the United States. And this was going to be how Montana really played its first active role in, in, the, uh, in the Cold War in the 1950s. And this was all through Operation Skywatch. How many of you have ever heard of the Ground Observer Corps before? few of you, did some of you actually serve in it as teenagers? Yes. <laughs> you did. All right. Unfortunately, most of the people that I'm meeting now, not unfortunately, but um, a lot of the people I'm meeting now were teenagers who were involved in it, that their parents have since passed away. And um, yeah, the teenagers have an interesting perspective on Operation Skywatch as well. So what this was essentially was an attempt by the United States Air Force to kind of jury-rig an early warning system in case the Soviets did come, <coughs> excuse me, come across the polar region. Um, this was a revitalization of a program that existed during World War II on the east and west coast, um, but was uh, re-emerged re at the end of the 1940s when it was, uh, the United States was in the process of developing a modernized radar network that would um, really give you a good, a good uh, sense of, of whether the Soviets were coming or not. Um, it was very simple. It just required civilian volunteers to be watching the skies and listening for any kind of aircraft that couldn't be identified, at least initially. And they did this very quickly, or very easily. Um, you joined this ground, you volunteered for the Ground Observer Corps. There was a, a massive advertising council campaign that was um, orchestrated by the Air Force to get people to volunteer. Only thing you had to do, uh, or only thing you had to have to, uh, to be a ground observer was to be an adult, at least initially, and then uh, have good eyesight, even though there were a few blind um, uh, ground observers, sky watchers, and uh, you have to pass a loyalty test and have good judgment. And if you pass those three things, you could be a ground observer, which meant you got absolutely no pay, of course, but you were doing something that the Air Force was telling you was of value to the country, and it really appealed to the patriotism of the people of that time. So in Montana, people volunteered in droves for the Ground Observer Corps because this was an important part of that whole system because of the sparse population and wide open spaces. And um, so at its height in 1954, over 11,000 Montanans volunteered to serve in the Ground Observer Corps as sky watchers. Um, once they made it, they passed everything. They had to take a two hour um, class they had to, then they got a badge that they were supposed to wear when they were doing their, their duty. 
which was supposed to be at least one two-hour volunteer shift per week. But in Montana, they wanted all the, the observation posts to be manned for, uh, 24 hours a day. So that meant that um, a, lot of, a lot of men and women um, served multiple volunteer shifts to make sure that those, um, those posts were manned or womaned um, as, uh, as, as much as they possibly could. If you saw something, which was supposed to be a multi-engine craft, an airplane, or a jet. Could be kind of a lonely job, too, as well as you can see in this, um, in this photograph. Um, also, the, uh, the Advertising Council um, put up billboards like these to get people to volunteer. They ran radio spots and um, little movie shorts and uh, put out posters and what have you to get people to volunteer, and lots of stuff in the newspapers. Of course, in those days, most people got their news still from the newspapers, and that was the best source. Uh, if you wanted to get the information out, that's the way you did it, unlike today with the Internet. Um, they also put up posters. The one there on the left is probably my favorite. What better way to get people to volunteer for the Ground Observer Corps than pulling on your heartstrings a little bit to make sure we protect this little boy and his stuffed animal? And... Uh, my wife has been actually letting me collect Ground Observer store, Corps stuff. And this one was rather expensive when it came out on eBay. And I figured I would be in for a fight, but um, she said, order it. So, but she won't let me hang it up in the living room yet. <laughs> so maybe that'll come later. Other things is if you did volunteer and you were accepted, which most people who did volunteer were accepted, you got this aircraft rec recognition guide. Um, I have one of these in my library, and I don't know how I got it, but it's there. And because I thought my dad maybe was an observer, and he says I it wasn't mine. So, but uh, this goes to show if you're a good have a good library, you get stuff, and you don't know where it comes from. Uh, you also got one of these little cards there on the lower left to, uh, to, to say that you're a member of the Sky Watchers. And then you also got a thing there on the lower right. This is called a altitude and distance finder. And it's a very simple little plastic card, translucent. And if you saw something that you were supposed to hold that card up to where the airplane was, and it would give you an approximate altitude. And then also to give you a sense of what distance it was, or what, you know, whatever distance it was away from the observer. And so it was really a rather ingenious little thing. And every observer got one. And then you also, of course, got to wear the badge that is there on the upper, upper right-hand side. Um, it's a very simple program, actually, that there was two, group, two parts of it. There was the observers, and then there was the filter centers. And the filter centers is where they processed the information coming from the, uh, from the observation posts. And in Montana, there was two filter centers, one here in Helena that was in the old high school building for a long time before that building became a little bit too unsafe. And uh, as most of you might, some of you may remember that building. I remember it being kind of spooky. But uh, then they moved it onto the fourth floor of the Montana Club, which seemed to be kind of a good idea because the woman who was in charge of the Ground Observer Corps in, Mon in Helena, her husband was also the chairman of the board or the president of the board of the Montana Club, too. So it worked out pretty well. But anyway, uh, so there's those two parts. You served your two hour shifts. Um, usually you sat in the tower, and sometimes you sat there with somebody else, so it's a good time to, to kind of converse with whoever it is you're volunteering with and hope that you like that person because you have to spend the next two hours with them. And then if you do some, see something, then you go out, you hold up that little card, you uh, get the approximate uh, information that you're going to need, and then you phone that into one of the two filter centers, the one in Helena or the one in Billings, if you're depending on what side of the state you're in. And then they keep track of that airplane on a big board, essentially. And you've all seen that. There's a photo of one here coming up. And so hopefully by the time you get to a certain point, you'll be able to identify what that craft aircraft was. And uh, if you can't, then you call one of the local Air Force bases, either Ent Air Force Base in Colorado or else Malmstrom. They'll sc scramble fighters and send those up to try and make a first-hand identification of that particular uh, bogey. 
But as far as I can tell, that didn't happen very often, if at all, at least not here in Montana. Usually the newspapers are really good about reporting what the Corps was doing, and uh, that has never come up so far in, in, uh, in, that, uh, in, in my research. Um, these are examples of a couple of the t observation towers. The one on the uh, left is on, sat on top of the Finland Hotel and top of the elevator shaft works at the top. And the other one is the Joliet um, observation tower. Um, the Finland Hotel, I met a woman who served time there as, as, a, as a sky watcher and as, a, as a teenager. And she said, well, I never saw anything. But, you know, she says it was all worth it because the, uh, the view from the top of the Finland was, was spectacular. So I would guess that was the case for a lot of these people, that that would probably be the case. Um, again, almost anybody or everybody could be a sky watcher. There was initially age restrictions, but eventually those went by the wayside. Um, the government or the Air Force wasn't going to turn down people who wanted to do their patriotic duty. And so the Star School on the Blackfeet Reservation had a ground observer corps squad, squadron there, made up of school kids, including Earl Oldperson, who is one of the more prominent members of the tribe now. There was also old soldiers, veterans that uh, were living at the old soldiers' home in Columbia Falls that served as sky watchers. And then even Custer Battlefield had um, a little group of, of uh, veterans down there, who, including a, a relative of Custer, supposedly, who was, uh, was also a sky watcher. So it didn't really matter who you were, as long as you were willing to sit outside in inclement weather and spend your time scanning the skies, looking for something that, that could be a threat to the United States. And all these volunteers worked very closely with the Air Force. And in the long run, this was the most successful PR program the Air Force ran during the 1950s, was the Ground Observer Corps. Um, again, you could be any age. This Montana had the distinction of having the country's youngest ground observer. And this is her. This is little Anna Stearns. She was, uh, lived up in Big Fork, Montana. She was an only child. Uh, her father was a pastor up there. And so the three of them were one of the observation groups. Her father was the chief observer, or the observation post supervisor. Her mother was the chief observer. And Anna later told me she was just plain observer. <laughs> so amazingly, I got an email from her out of the blue saying I was the youngest ground observer in the United States. And I knew right off who it was. It was I said, you're Anna Stearns? And so we still maintain that, that, uh, that relationship over the internet anyway. Um, she served about 2,500 hours as a sky watcher for a seven-year-old girl. And so you would think that that was pretty impressive, but she'll be the first one to tell you, well, what happened was I think my parents got a little bit tired of me, so they told me to go outside and play. <laughs> and so whenever I saw something out there that I was supposed to run back inside and tell them what it is that I saw, and they would report it to the filter center here in Helena. But in any case, she's a great lady, and she has only good memories about that time she served as a, as a sky watcher here in Montana. Um, in fact, the whole story of the Sky Watchers is nothing but good, uh, good stories, in fact. Um, you read a lot about it in the newspapers. One of my favorite is the Gold Bonds. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gold Bond up in uh, Geraldine had a really large television antenna on top of their house, and they were on the flight path between the Malmstrom Air Force Base and wherever. So they would sit in their house and wait until an airplane would come over and interfere with their television reception. Then they would go outside, make the observation, and then call it into into Helena. So I always felt kind of bad for them. If they're right in the middle of the Milton Berle show or your show of shows or something, you have to get up and go outside and look for this airplane. It must have been kind of a kind of a pain for them. But they served, you know, a few thousand hours as observers too. And in fact, after a while, it got a little bit old just going outside and looking for this thing, these things, so that um, some men. Um, rigged up these, the jury rigged these listening devices so they could hear the airplanes coming with them. And usually these were things like intercom systems or whatever that they, that they modified for use 
They would place them outside the observation post and wait until they heard something, and then they would go out and look for the airplane. Um, there was also a man who did his, his duty from uh, the back of a horse carrying a Winchester rifle. So I don't know if he expected Russian paratroopers or not, but, uh, but in any case, that's how he, he served his, his time as a, as a volunteer. Um, the only other real restriction was that you had to have access to a, tele, a telephone so you could call in your, uh, your observation to, uh, to the filter center. So in Fromberg, the observation post was right next to, or standing next to the only telephone booth in town. So if you were in Reed Point, you did your duty, you did your volunteer shift from the, um, from the local library because it had the only telephone that had a connection to Billings and the, uh, and the filter center there. So, you know, it's, it's um, when you get out into eastern Montana, it's a little bit dicier because it's a lot more remote and uh, not everybody had a telephone yet. All right. Now there was an observation tower in the parking lot of the Buffalo Hills Golf Course in Kalispell. And Kalispell actually had one of the most active of all the uh, ground observer groups in the state of Montana. And they worked very hard to get volunteers to come out and, uh, and sign up to... Uh, to uh, serve their time. Now, here's the other part that I think is very interesting, and you probably wouldn't think of until you really think about it, is what's one thing the Air Force might have you looking for while you're standing out there sky watching? Flying saucers. Flying saucers, exactly. And that was actually one of the things they wanted you to look for, specifically. If you weren't going to find a Russian bomber, in which the Russians really didn't have any that could reach the United States quite at the time this was all going on, um, that they wanted you to report on unusual weather phenomenon and also on airplanes that were in distress and to report flying saucers. And yes, they did spot a few here in Montana. And I'm not sure how many they saw, but what happened was those were treated differently than the regular observations. So you would call in the, whatever it was you were seeing to the filter center and you'd tell them, you know, I've got the UFO here or whatever, and they would fill out a different form for those and those forms went directly to the Air Force and they got lost in the bureaucracy. So a lot of these people, they wanted to know what it is they saw and there was no way to find out because the Air Force wasn't talking about it. So they were a little bit more concerned about it than they let on, I think. But uh, there are a few cases where there's something in the newspapers where they saw something that they couldn't explain. Um, Anna Stern's mother, in fact, saw something that she couldn't explain and had the same runaround. She called, to, tried to find out what it was, and they, they weren't going to be telling her anything. But uh, how often that happened, I don't know. Um, I believe there is a, there's an organization called the Mutual UFO Network, and they do keep track of the did keep track of these things. But I've been having a hard time getting uh, access to uh, to them to find out exactly how much they might have, how many of these things they might have seen in, in Montana. The filter centers were really the brains of the whole operation, and this is where um, again it gets a little more interesting to me as well that. Um, these were places where the observation posts would call in. They're mostly manned by women and teenagers. So women took a very active role in the Sky Watchers organization. There was the two filter centers here in Montana, and both of them were supervised by women. And most of the staffs there were women who were supervised by Air Force personnel. This was the only place you could be where you'd actually come into much contact with the, uh, with the Air Force. But they also had a fair number of teenagers who would volunteer to serve in, uh, in the filter centers as well. And so that's why I like this photograph. It kind of shows you the mix of, of who was actually um, staffing these things during the time that the, uh, the Sky Watchers organization was really going. Um, the, my mother was a teenage filter center um, volunteer, although she volunteered for all the wrong reasons. Being 16 years old, she wasn't much interested in national defense. She was interested in hanging out with her friends. And uh, so teenagers haven't really changed that much. But uh, so I gave this talk down in Billings to the Yellowstone Corral, the Westerners, and she piped up and says, so that's what I was volunteering for. <laughs> so, oh, Mom, you never told me. But 
Anyway, the filter centers uh, were manned or staffed 24 hours a day. Um, mostly there was always Air Force personnel there along with the, uh, with the civilians. And, uh, and these are really the, the more important, the more visible parts of the, uh, the sky watchers than the ob observers. Um, in Billings, they, uh, they had a, a float in the annual Western Day Parade every year. And they also had a big exhibit at the, at the fair during the summertime. They actually even, let's see if I got a photograph, here's a picture of the inside of the Helena Filter Center at the, when it was at the old high school. And, uh, but in Billings, they also had a Ground Observer Day where they managed to get Frontier Airlines to christen one of their DC-3 passenger planes, the uh, Billings Filter Center. Uh, and uh, it was a big deal. I mean, they had important uh, Air Force personnel or officers come and, and talk to everybody and, and whatever. But uh, Aircraft Flash was a magazine that came out monthly, at least initially, that provides an awful lot of information about what every what the uh, what the Corps was doing in every state, but also lets members of the Corps know what the military is doing to protect them. Talks about new technology, about how their airplanes work and some of their weapon systems work, and the importance of nuclear warheads and, and that type of thing. So it's uh, really kind of a neat little magazine, which they have it on microfilm upstairs in the research center. That um, that's the only way to do it because they're too expensive to buy on on uh, eBay anymore. So I can't talk my wife into that yet. All right, but things started to change towards the end of the 1950s, and that was mostly because a more reliable radar network was coming online. And uh, this is just a, a, a diagram of which ones we had, the dew line, distant early warning line, the mid-Canada line, and the pine tree line, that as those came on and uh, became functional, that really the need for the ground observer core diminished. And the Air Force never intended the Corps to really be around, be a permanent part of their defense um, strategy. That it was only a stopgap measure until they could get something like this going that they, so that they didn't need them. So by the end of the 1950s, they put the, uh, the Observer Corps on standby alert, which meant they only were uh, supposed to be activated in time of emergency. Um, they closed the filter center in Helena and consolidated its operations with Billings in 1958. And, um, and so eventually, by the end of 1958, the Air Force announced the, uh, the deactivation of the Ground Observer Corps, and it officially ended on January 31st, 1959. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, it was an interesting little experiment, and the Air Force never really had much faith in it, and, um, and they did try to... Uh, to, well, they did test them, but you know, usually they gave you a warning that the test was coming. But on the t occasions where it was a surprise test of the system, they didn't, um, they weren't too impressed by what uh, what they were doing. A lot of it's apathy. I mean, a lot of places in Montana, they never saw an airplane. Um, the one I like the best is at Divide, Montana, down there south of uh, Butte. They hadn't seen an airplane in weeks, and so they complained about it to the Air Force, and the Air Force started sending jet aircraft over <laughs> about once a week just to keep them on their toes. But as everything, the technology improved, and it became clear that the Observer Corps was on its way out, that volunteers started to leave the organization pretty, uh, pretty quickly. And so by the, end of the by the end of January 1959, it was really just a shell of what it had been before. But I think the value of the Ground Observer Corps can be best summed up by the words of a Kalispell sky watcher in 1955. And she said, quote, it is fun, it is important, and we learn something as well as experiencing the feeling of having accomplished something for the good of our country and the well-being of our fellow men. So I think that is a good testimonial to, to the Ground Observer Corps, that um, not only you know, did it fulfill a valuable function, at least in the minds of the volunteers, but it also gave them a chance to really network with their, their fellow um, residents in certain areas as well. Well, all this is also going on that we do have a radar network before 1959. In fact, it begins in 1952. The Air Force starts establishing radar stations around Montana, mostly in the rural areas and fairly isolated places. 
Um, and I believe there was eight of them in Montana at its height. They only really functioned from about 1952 up until the late 1960s, and then the Air Force started abandoning the sites. The last one to be abandoned was north of, um, it was north of uh, Haver in 1979. But these were like little frontier outposts. I said, this is kind of the way I equate it. It's like being those old forts in the westerns on television. These places are self-contained little communities. They have radar domes, uh, ray domes like this one here. And, um, but they've also got families living there. They've got you know, mess halls, rec halls, bowling alleys, you know, shops where, where guys who are out there could work on their cars, um, plus all the warehouses and other things that really go along with, uh, with the military base, essentially. But the only thing being is they're in the middle of nowhere. And so you have to go a long ways to get anywhere. So um, fortunately, I uh, got in contact with an old radar base, radar station vet, who wanted a historical marker talking about what it is, their contributions to the Cold War. And I had never heard about these guys before. And uh, so we did put up a sign out by uh, Miles City to talk about the Miles City radar station, since that seems to be the one that everybody talks about anymore. And the 778th Radar Squadron is, uh, is the group that, that served there at Miles City. And so um, this is what the station would have looked like at the end of the 1950s. So as you can see, there's a, it's really quite a, quite a complicated little area. And then this is what the site looks like today. That it was abandoned in the early 70s and just everything was pretty much picked up and, and moved somewhere else. So you can go visit these places, but I believe a lot of them are on uh, private land. But, um, but I think they're also you know, an important part of the Cold War that we really don't know anything about here in Montana. And all of these guys have a, a story to tell. And usually the stories they tell are about how cold it was in the wintertime, uh, about how hot it was in the summer, that there was a lot of black widow spiders, and my all-time favorite, a lot of rattlesnakes. So you really couldn't let your kids outside to play too much because, uh, because there was things out there. This one guy was telling me, oh, I, there was this, this big African-American airman there who was, was raising black widows and had them in the barracks and was, you know, I thought, yeah. <laughs> that's my least favorite spider. But, um, but the radar men were welcomed into the communities near where they served, and a lot of them had second jobs in places like Miles City, Kalispell, Haver, what have you. And uh, so they did become important parts of those communities that they served near as well. But as the technology improved and the, uh, the stations were continuously upgraded, and they were just there to monitor aircraft traffic coming in from the north across Canada. And so I asked one of them as well, I said, did you see anything weird or have anything weird happen to you? And the only one he said was, yeah, we were monitoring some guy coming across very fast from Canada. And so we were calling him to find out who it was. And finally he answered and told us to mind our own effing business. <laughs> and so his guy says, well, you know what he thinks it was? He thought, I think it was probably a U-2 because those were still fairly top secret at that time. But he says, man, that thing was moving fast, and we didn't know what it was, and uh, they weren't going to talk about it as well. But um, in the late 1950s, the, uh, the Air Force um, finally deployed something called the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment Computer, SAGE computer, that interconnected the different radar stations and the gap filler stations in Montana, and to providing a bigger, a better unified picture of what was going on radar-wise. Um, it's because of the development of SAGE that, um, that the Ground Observer Corps really became unnecessary because it was indeed the first um, digital computer system and it was designed to, uh, for defense purposes here in the United States. But the Radar Vets remain an active organization. Um, they do have a website. It's uh, called Online Air Defense Museum or Museum. And they do have chat rooms, and sometimes I plug into those just to hear the, uh, the stuff going on between. They don't talk about Montana very often. Mostly they talk about Vietnam, because there were some radar stations there as well. And, 
and in other places that were a little bit too warm, not like Montana. All right. Of course, the two uh, obvious parts of the Cold War here in Montana were Malmstrom Air Force Base up at Great Falls and uh, Glasgow Air Force Base up in northeastern Montana. And uh, Glasgow was the last one to come online. And uh, of course, Great Falls is going to be important eventually as being the, uh, the headquarters for the missile wing here in Montana. But uh, Glasgow was part of the Strategic Air Command, and that was a base for, um, for B-52 bombers. And uh, if any of you been up there, have any of you seen the Air Force Base? It's kind of a spooky place. I mean, it's, uh, it's a 20th century ghost town essentially, and it's just kind of like one of those little towns they built to test nuclear warheads. And you kind of expect something to happen when you drive by it, but... Uh, St. Marie. St. Marie, yep. Oh my yep, St. Marie is it. And here's an aerial photo of it, what it looks like today. That little um, thing down in the uh, lower right-hand corner is where they parked the B-52s so that they could take off at fairly moment's notice. It's an 8,900-foot um, runway as well, and eventually, I think, I believe Boeing owns the, uh, the runway now yeah. and uh, tests out its, um, its airplanes there. But there are people living in St. Marie, uh, some of them kind of involved in dubious um, activities, but a lot of squatters there, too, I understand. The air base opened in 1957 and closed in... Um, in 19, uh, 1971 as part of the uh, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty um, conditions. But all this is going to change. Um, it's going to change fairly radically and very quickly in, in October 1957. You all know what this is, I bet. Sputnik, Sputnik 1. Yep, it was with the launch, Soviet launching of Sputnik 1 that the Cold War changed forever. Any, have, any of you have an idea why? I always get my students with this one. Well, that was part of it. Most of what it was that caused so much angst was not so much the satellite itself, but the rocket that took it into orbit. Because then you're introducing intercontinental ballistic missiles into the, into the Cold War. And there really is no defense against ICBMs. And so with that, the Cold War took a very frightening turn, I think. And this is where Montana really becomes important to the whole uh, weapons system of the United States, defense system of the United States in the process. Uh, there are currently 150 nuclear missile silos in Montana. That's down from about 200 that were, uh, were here at its height in the 1970s. Um, most of them, have, you've probably seen them occasionally when you go to Lewistown or up to Great Falls. There's that nice one right next to the interstate, just north of, of Cascade. But um, this is really a, a two-part system as well. You see the silos mostly, but there's also the launch facilities. And these are the places that have the above-ground buildings. And those are the places where the men and women are down in the capsules waiting to push the button if they have to do it. So, unfortunately, these kind of weapons really don't have a military application. They're mostly designed as a terror weapon. That the mere having them is enough to be a deterrent against trying to, against starting a war. Because they're not designed so much to take out military installations as they are to kill as many people as they possibly, as they possibly can. All right. Just an example, I believe this is, a, this is a, the ones we have in Montana are solid fuel rockets, but in the southern part of the country they had liquid fueled rockets. I believe this is, I think, one of the solid fuel rockets here. Um, they began building the silos in 1961. Um, Joe Reber here in Helena, who was a very prominent contractor, had a contract with the government to build uh, missile silos for, uh, for a number of years. And um, they had to condemn the land occasionally to get a spot for them. Uh, there's a nice man up in Lewistown named Leroy Music. He'll tell you the whole story about how he didn't want one of these things on his land, but he really didn't have a choice. But and who's going to argue with the Air Force when you've got a bunch of guys there with uh, machine guns? But uh, in any case, um, 
Here's an example of what one of them looks like from the air. I was going to go up and take a photo of the one next to the interstate, but I thought better of it because I know the, the uh, security forces respond pretty quickly. And there is a case where I would have a problem explaining to my wife why I was in jail, just to get a picture of a silo. But um, the one that's really, and here's a, a Minuteman II missile, I believe. And these missiles are um, designed to carry multiple warheads. So it isn't just the one nuclear bomb on the tip of them. That's a series of them, up to 10, I believe, that uh, are supposed to disperse when they get to a certain point, which makes really defense against them impossible. And um, so you can see why the Cold War changed pretty radically with the introduction of um, the ICBMs in 1957. Uh, it was just a diagram of the existing missile field here in Montana and where they're at. And, um, and there was also a bunch surrounding the town of Conrad, but that, um, but that missile field was abandoned in the 1970s as part of one of the assault treaties. One of the launch facilities, I'm not sure where this is at. There's a couple of them along Highway 200 between Lewistown and Great Falls, if you're ever interested in looking for them. And then the one that's probably the most important in Montana, which also proved that Montana was a part of what was going on um, internationally was. And this, this missile, the Alpha-1, went in online in October 1962. And I think you all know the significance of that month with the Cuban Missile Crisis that uh, supposedly, the story goes, but it's never been verified, that Kennedy was able to, uh, to stare down Khrushchev over the missiles based in, in Cuba because he knew he had his ace in the hole in Montana. And that was the Alpha-6 um, nuclear missile that uh, went online during the crisis that the Soviets couldn't supposedly reach these with their weapons and they had no defense really against these any more than we had a defense against what they were pointed towards us. So this, uh, this missile is located in a silo just outside the little town of Monarch in Cascade County. If you drive down US Highway 89 there to Neihart from, from Monarch, you'll go right by the silo and probably not even know it was even there. But I thought it was worthwhile um, as part of upgrading our highway historical markers that maybe it was time to start looking at the, uh, the Cold War as an historical event in Montana that's just as important as the, uh, as the, uh, the Indian Wars and, and the gold rushes and all that. Because this did have a profound effect on all of us you know, after, after World War II. And so I uh, did talk to the Air Force about it. And I said, is it OK if we put up a sign? And they were very good. And they said, well, how can we help as long as you don't attach it to the fence around the silo? And I said, believe me, I don't want to do that. And so they provided a lot of the information that I needed. If you read this, you'll also find that there's a typo in it, that uh, ALPA 06 launch facility that uh, somehow got by the, uh, the manufacturer of the sign. And uh, well, anyway, so I heard quite a bit about that from the guy that lived in the, black, the brick house behind it. But um, anyway, the ace in the hole is really probably the most well-known and maybe the most important of the nuclear missiles here in Montana. And uh, so I, I would recommend stopping to read the sign, look across the highway, and that's about where the, uh, where the silo is at. Um, is it still operational? Still operational. It still has, it still has something in there. So, um, and every time I look at them, I don't know about you and there are other people in the audience, you know, I look at them and I think of what, what's there, you know, what that thing and that hole there can do. And it is frightening. And um, it does make you maybe get a sense of, of how important Montana is to this whole strategy of the United States. But also a very negative feeling about what's in that thing in the first place. Even though I would love to go down in one of those silos sometime, but I think it would still be kind of a, uh, kind of a, kind of a, I, I don't want to say make me uncomfortable doing it just because of what's sitting on top of the rocket there as well. But anyway, uh, otherwise, outside of the missiles, um, again, we have 150 of them active here in Montana. Um, Amounts from Air Force bases ahead of the 341st missile wing, or it was, 
And so they're all uh, based there. Um, if you ever get a tour of the air base, they'll tell you there's this one spot that they'll have to shoot you if you have to go down there because that's where the bombs are. And of course, that was the spot I wanted to go see the most, but I uh, didn't get to do that. But there was other parts of the Cold War as well that were very um, pervasive here in Montana. And one of that, of course, one of those things, of course, is the propaganda and the information that the government was producing during that time to assure you that you could survive a nuclear war, only if you did the right thing. And I think people back then were uh, maybe a little bit more naive now than they are today or whatever, but there was a lot more optimism about surviving a war than there is today. And even though there's always that group of people that said they'd rather, get, they'd rather die than survive it. But um, Helena had its share of, of fallout shelters. Um, the one I remember the most, of course, was in the basement of the uh, Helena Junior High or the middle school. And then they had the barrels of water, the crackers, the bandages, and everything down there that, um, you know, you kind of hope that, uh, that you never had to, uh, had to go experience firsthand. Although I did try some of their crackers once, and you may want to get killed by the bomb first. <laughs> um, fallout shelters, I'm not really sure how many backyard fallout shelters there are here in Montana. There's undoubtedly a few. Um, I would like to find some, though. I think uh, whatever, wherever they're at, they would be worthy of listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, there was a, a bunch of different designs of what you could build. Um, we did go to an estate sale here a few years ago, and I bought a set of plans for 10 bucks. And again, my wife didn't quite understand why I wanted fallout shelter plans. And I used the good old term, well, I just thought I should have them in case. But, uh, but they're very detailed. And also how, how long you should stay in them, what, you know, the do's and don'ts of having your own bomb shelter. But I found out later that I actually spent some of my college years in a bomb shelter and didn't know it. How many, anybody from Bozeman here? Sort of. Sort of. We have Bozeman in our, in our audience, Martha? Uh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I lived in the basement of this house on West Garfield Street in Bozeman. It was the best apartment I ever lived in because it was three blocks from campus and you had to walk by the sorority houses to get to class. So I really liked this place. But my bedroom was under the garage. And um, having a bedroom under a garage is pretty unusual. And the walls under there were a lot thicker. And I think a lot of that was because it was, had to support a car in the garage. But we found out later, this was uh, designed by an architect by the last name of Eck, that this was designed as a bomb shelter. And so I loved it. It was a great place to to, to spend the summers because it was a lot cooler there than it was anywhere else. So there are a few around, and this one was one I just kind of found out about after the fact, that, uh, that that's house at 117 West Garfield has a bomb shelter under the garage. Um, another thing I just wanted to talk about very quickly so I can answer a few questions if you have any, is that um, there are other things out on the plains that really um, are part of the Cold War as well. And these are things that I hear about continuously but don't really know much about. This is one of them. This is a concrete bunker, essentially, that's um, up near Lake, uh, Tizer Lake, Tiber Lake, Tiber Reservoir, excuse me, that uh, belonged to something called the Perimeter Acquisition Radar, PAR. And this was an anti-ballistic missile site that was being constructed from, began in 1968. They hadn't finished it in 1972 when the SALT-1 treaty was signed and then they just abandoned it, walked away from it. And so this is like, you know, out in the middle of the, of the plains of Montana that's uh, been abandoned for 40 some years. And uh, one of those mysteries, I think, for a lot of people who see it, that what was that thing? It was definitely part of the Cold War as well. But other parts of it that I really enjoy about the Cold War, of course, are the Twilight Zone episodes. This one called Time Enough at Last, where he thinks he's going to get to read all the books that he can possibly read without anybody bothering him and breaks his glasses. And one thing that we didn't have to deal with at all were mutants. <laughs> this is from a movie called Fiend Without a Face. And uh, 
was definitely, you know, radar beams had caused these, uh, these brains to grow and become sentient by themselves like this. So we were lucky. We, there wasn't a nuclear war because we would have had to deal with mutations as well. So, and then finally the, bomb, the fallout shelter signs. But, you know, the Cold War is still very much here. And it's just all around us still. And some of it has never quite gone away. And I think probably during our lifetimes it'll always be here. But um, it's something we learned to live with, that although it was frightening, we couldn't let it bother us too much or else we would have some definitely some mental issues about the whole thing. And then ultimately, we never did go to war with the Soviet Union, and we won the Cold War, but I think we're also in danger of having, you know, the, the danger of nuclear war hasn't gone away just yet, and maybe even more dangerous now than it was then. But um, so... I think this is an important part of Montana history that we really need to, uh, to look at a little bit more seriously and a little bit more in depth, and I'm hoping to be able to do that as time goes on. Um, and also, just to uh, settle an old, an old uh, misconception, how many of you believe the interstates were built for military purposes? <laughs> the interstates, were they built for the military? No. No, they were built to uh, facilitate commerce. They weren't built to facilitate the military like the Autobahn system was in Germany. It was built so that trucks could get around the country a lot faster, and, uh, and also pass, uh, passenger cars as well. Um, there are a few things that were, excuse me, that were incorporated into the interstate system that had something to do with the Cold War. One of them is that there's a uniform height for all the overpasses on the interstate, and that was done so that missile trucks could get underneath them. And then there's this old story, and this is true, actually, a true part of it, is that every five miles you would find a straight stretch of interstate. And that was something the military wanted, supposedly, so that they could land and take off airplanes on the interstates if they had to. Well, back east they actually tried that, and it didn't work very well, and it wasn't very practical. And so you won't find that in Montana. But if you get out into the eastern part of the state, who would have needed to do that anyway? They're all straight anyhow. So, but anyway, I just wanted to, 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 to put the kibosh on that misconception about the interstates. So anyway, with that, I'll answer a few questions if I can. And, and then Martha is going to facilitate that. Yeah, for our audience out in the lobby and online, I'm going to repeat your questions, so short questions. Well, So, so the question is, was it the military uh, that got the High Line electrified because they needed electricity for their missiles? I can't say that for sure, but I can tell you this, that the military takes care of the county roads that go, they access the missile silos. So the counties got out of that pretty well after, after 1961. So it's the military that maintains those roads and builds the bridges. They're, they're paved, and uh, we've got a nice book at the MDT that shows you where all the underground cables are. And, uh, and I, I was going to share that, but I thought, eh, probably better not. <laughs> I like to keep my job. So. Yeah. Do you know if the Soviet Union had any Soviet missile towers or some fallout shelters and see everybody that went up the sky? So so did the Soviet Union have any kind of comparable programs like Operation Skywatch and, and the likes? You know, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine they didn't. But um, that's worth something to, to look into to see if there was something. All I, I can really tell you is they had no airplanes that could reach the United States during the 1950s. The only thing they had as a bomber was, um, was modified B-29 super fortresses from World War II. So a lot of these people were looking for planes that would never have gotten this far. But, you know, a lot of what the Cold War was was mis, mis, uh, misconceptions and disinformation as well. So. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting. My experience. I was in the Army. When I was up in Syria when they built that. Kind of 
Yeah. We didn't have any sense of it at all. I never lost how long. Yeah. So yeah, you know, um, we all we all hear about the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, but there was other incidents well, as well. I can remember you. Know, I worked for the state and when they set up the defense system, you know, to guard against atomic attack and all that kind of the term was where the attack would come from. Yeah. And then what you said about nineteen seventy and the ICBM summit, and they were. I'm sorry, we have time for one more question right over there. Yeah. You. I've got an old atlas from 1964 that shows a regular commercial air route between here and areas in Canada like Calgary. Who do this uh, air observer for programs, et cetera? Have they canceled all those planes permanently because there are no planes <laughs> now from here to Canada? In 1954, there were planes for, uh, from here to Canada. Why not now, John? <laughs> I would think that would be based on economics, but I don't know um, for sure. Um, you know, they were taught, the ground observers were taught to recognize a passenger airplane fairly quickly. And it's, you know, it's in the identification guide as well. So I don't, I don't think the ground observers had anything, to, or the Cold War had anything to do with that. But um, I can't say for sure. I wish I could. It's a good question, though. And I'm sure John will stay for a few more minutes if folks want to visit with him and ask more questions um, privately. So thank you so much, John. Right, thank you.